Chapter 2. Matthew Cuthbert is surprised. Matthew Cuthbert and the sorrel mare jogged comfortably over the eight miles to Bright River. It was a pretty road, running along between snug farmsteads, with now and again a bit of balsamy fir wood to drive through, or a hollow where wild plums hung out their filmy bloom. The air was sweet with the breath of many apple orchards, and the meadows sloped away in the distance to horizon mists of pearl and purple, while the little birds sang as if it were the one day of summer in all the year. I'm Erica. I'm Jean Danielle. And this is Kindred Spirits. In chapter two, Matthew rides along to Bright River to the train station, pondering how terrified he is of all women and girls. Upon arrival at the platform, he walks briskly past a girl looking for a train that indeed has already passed. The station master meets with Matthew. Matthew asks, where's a boy? Station master says, oh, there's no boy, but there is a girl and my goodness, what a case she is. Matthew is confused and says he doesn't understand, but then begins to ride back to Green Gables with the girl who proceeds to speak for pages upon pages without breath. Having picked up the girl, she continues to speak and 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 speak. When confronted with, do I speak too much? Matthew just quietly says, oh, you can talk as much as you like. I don't mind. She seizes that opportunity, continues to speak, and then finally brings all of her worldly possessions into Green Gables. Did I mention Anne talks a lot? You touched on, yeah, you really touched on the main points of this chapter, which are Anne talks a lot and Matthew is afraid. But then Anne talks a lot and Matthew is okay with it. This chapter is the reason my dad read me this book once out loud and refused to ever again. Because of the amount that Anne speaks, he didn't want to have to read that out loud. I, I think Anne's speech is really the proto Lorelai Gilmore, but that's connecting a bit too many pop culture references, perhaps. But I think that uh, Amy, uh, Amy Sherman Palladino fast talking woman trope is owed to, in great part to Anne Shirley. Our listeners are not going to be able to see my face right now, but. I, that had never occurred to me, and my mind is blown. Oh so yeah, Rory touched... Gilmore is just an Anne Shirley wannabe. I don't know if I'd stand by that. Yeah, I can see it. I do. I can see it. So I would like to look at this chapter through the lens of fear. Other words that are used to mean similar things in the text are dread and anxiety. And of course those have slightly different connotations, but Matthew is described as being afraid first. I'm pretty sure that comes up first. Yes. When it's talk, um, no, dread is the one that comes up first. Dread. Matthew I dreaded all women except Marilla and Mrs. Rachel. So Matthew's fear, and specifically his fear of women, is such a focus of this chapter. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Certainly, I mean, and why he is afraid of them. They are mysterious and maybe laughing at him. Um, so I, I think a lot of his fear to me is encapsulated in something he says. I don't understand, said Matthew helplessly. I think he feels helpless and confused a lot because he just doesn't understand. And of course, um, I think he's painted as being in this unfortunate vicious cycle when it comes to understanding women, which is he doesn't understand them, so he's terrified of them. So he doesn't interact with them, which leads to continued not understanding them. Um, and then I, of course, it's, I have my modern bias questions about the gender essentialism of thinking that understanding women is so different than understanding men. And my hypothesis is Matthew probably doesn't understand anybody. And he might actually just be more afraid of what women think because he might value their opinions more than men. I just think it's so funny that Matthew dreaded all women except Marilla and Mrs. Rachel. Like they are both such formidable women. In yes, both please. a good and a bad way. 
which to me indicates that his fear isn't rooted in um, sexism or fear of power. I think it's very clear he's afraid of confusion. And so it's not, uh, Marilla and Rachel are both very strong, but I think he knows their motives. So he's not confused by that. Uh, what scares him isn't strength, it's surprise, which of course then yeah. makes Matthew Cuthbert is surprised an absolute horror movie of a chapter title for him. Oh, I love, I love that take on it. That Mrs. Rachel Lynde is surprised is like her afternoon entertainment, whereas Matthew Cuthbert is surprised is like the worst thing to happen to him in 20 years. And yeah, and we'll get to it more next time, but Marilla's surprise is a pragmatic obstacle to be solved. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, Rachel chuckles at surprise. Matthew's terrified by surprise, and Marilla's just surprised. What are you doing here? That's not the plan. We're going to fix the plan. There will be no surprises tomorrow. <laughs> Which, uh, spoiler alert, there will be. Um, yeah, I think I really, when you're thinking of um, or asking about synonyms for the fear, I think we are all prone to fear different things. And I really latched on to, with Matthew, this idea of helplessness and mysterious. That not knowing what's going on and not having any control over it is seems to be his fear triggers here. Yes, definitely. And I also wrote that um, in my notes that Matthew's fear of little girls specifically I'll need a minute to find this in the text but that his fear of little girls is because of their their fear towards him mm -hmm. so it's even a magnification of that vicious cycle you were talking about with grown women when he's interacting with little girls that they're afraid of him so he's afraid of them so he doesn't talk to them so they giggle so he thinks they're giggling about him when actually they're probably giggling because they're afraid too it's so fascinating and sad and Anne's oddness I think is what breaks him out of that cycle that she well, she talks to him, and she's going to talk to him regardless of what he does. And she doesn't have friends, which is a terrible and sad thing to say. But because she doesn't have people her age, her gender, her, you know, anything else that might be in common with her, she lashes onto Matthew instead and doesn't really give him a choice whether or not He'll let her. Well, and I think one of the things I find interesting that's made clear in the Anne and Matthew relationship, starting in their first interaction, is Anne doesn't like rules. She doesn't like that children should be seen and not heard. She wants to be heard. And Matthew doesn't like a lack of rules, not because he's strict, but because he likes the security of expectations. And this could be a paradox that's a tension for them, but it's actually a paradox that makes their relationship work starting in this first ride home. That he is fine with the rule being, you do all the talking and I listen. He just needs to know what the game is. Uh, it doesn't have to be the traditional or proper rule, a la Rachel Lind. It just needs to be something that he knows, this is what you expect of me? Sit here and listen to you? Great. Uh, and then she knows. Well, and the narrator actually tells us that 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 the kind of little girl Matthew is most afraid of is the Avonlea type of well-bred little girl. That those rules of children should be seen and not heard. That's why he's so afraid of children is because they don't say anything. So he has no idea what's going on with them. That makes me wonder, does he have a panic attack in the barn the first time Diana Barry comes over for a play date? Because she's... The scary type. She's the one that he's scared of. Maybe, but Matthew also... We never get told an acreage of Green Gables, but I think we can assume that it's a fairly sizable farm. 
So Matthew has a fair amount of space to get away mm-hmm. from Diana Barry when <laughs> she's around. And he's had contact with her before because her father is their nearest neighbor and that's important for farmers. <clears throat> I also wanted to talk a little bit about Anne's fear that yes. it's not explicitly mentioned because this chapter is more or less from Matthew's limited point of view as far as the narration goes. But Anne is, you know, her background situation that she has never been well taken care of in her life. And now she's been abandoned at a train station and she doesn't know if anybody is coming. She's planning on sleeping in a tree. This 11 year old is planning to sleep in a tree and that seems like a reasonable, safe solution to her if she's been abandoned. And so <laughs> she, she has to be afraid. This is a frightening situation. Mm-hmm. And yet we don't hear any of that from her mouth. Instead, we hear about trees looking like brides and sleeping in cherry tree and prowling about on the ferry boat on the way over. I wanted to know, you you mentioned accurately that this is a Matthew point of view chapter, but Lucy Maud Montgomery deliberately breaks the fourth wall because Matthew's observations are not good enough to her and says, you know, what he saw, but an ordinary observer would have seen this, which, okay, fair enough. But then an extraordinary observer um, would see this really being explicit that Matthew, I think, copes with his fears and just his reality by not seeing everything that one of the ways he manages mystery is by seeing the things he understands almost, I don't know if it's implied as almost willful. That you just just look down, see what you're wanting to see, what you can manage to see, what you can expect to see. Uh, But an an ordinary observer would see even more. And then an extraordinary observer would actually pay attention to this girl at a detail. That is true i did make a note that the narrator is unfair to matthew at another point in this chapter Mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if this sentence that you're talking about matthew was not looking at her and would not have seen what she was really like if he had been i'm wondering if that might actually be the narrator again being unfair to matthew it's true that in this moment yes, I think his social anxiety would have prevented him from making any valuable observations about Anne, aside from the fact that she's a person. But very quickly, I think actually probably by the end of this chapter, Matthew becomes such an ally for Anne. And I think he sees her for who she is in a way that Marilla and Rachel and other people who have an idea of what they're looking for, who form an idea of Anne based on her appearance, aren't able to. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how much I trust that sentence, actually. That he might not be able to make visual observations, but he's able to see something in her that makes him fight for her right away, like as soon as the next chapter. Well, he finds her irresistible. Or in the sense that he cannot resist anything she chooses. And that's clear within this chapter Uh, Matthew had taken the scrawny little hand awkwardly in his then and there he decided what to do. He could not tell this child with the glowing eyes that there had been a mistake. So he's portrayed as not really observing her uh, kind of impoverished exterior and yet he does notice her glowing eyes. So I think that's getting at what you're saying that uh, people would immediately see the shaggy dress, the scrawny body, and 
use their heuristics to draw all kinds of possibly false conclusions. And Matthew, this allegedly non-extraordinary observer, is holding her hand, seeing her glowing eyes. Uh, and the glowing eyes also, I think, shows a, an intro into a paradox that gets to Anne's fears, where she speaks in a particularly clear, sweet voice. The child responded cheerfully. And of course, every adaptation of Anne of Green Gables really leans into this like very bubbly, vivacious persona. But pay attention to the words she says. And I think when we perceive Anne as this endlessly happy, cheery, bubbly child, and don't pay attention to her words, which is so tragic because she thinks about her words so carefully despite speaking a lot. She's not casual in her language ever. The child responded cheerfully, I can carry it, it isn't heavy. I've got all my worldly goods in it, but it isn't heavy. How cheery does she have to say, it's got all my worldly goods in it, but it isn't heavy, for us not to realize that is an utterly tragic line. It is so sad. Anne gets made of made fun of so much by the adult women in her life that for saying things are tragic or well actually tragical, which isn't a word, and that's part of the reason they make fun of her and poor kid, she's just eleven, give her a break she gets made fun of it so much that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that her existence has been completely tragic. Her having only a small bag full of belongings and probably not even anything that she particularly likes in there. She's probably wearing her only pair of shoes, wearing her only hat. I think in the next chapter, we find out that she has one nightgown, maybe one dress. We, she doesn't really have any clothing. She hasn't really been allowed to keep any books. So what does she have in there? She probably doesn't have much of anything. Yeah, and I think this is one of those things we see hints of it in her fast talking. We see not directly her fears, but we see her hopes, which are always uh, kind of a mirror to fears. You know, we talk, if you look at utopian literature or dystopian literature, either way, it's always a mirror to what at that time and that place people wanted most or feared most. So even if she's being very positive and cheery, it is, I think, always a mirror onto her fear. So why does she speak so eloquently and beautifully and positively about the trees? Well, she's coming up with a coping mechanism for very much having planned to sleep in one. So I think actually exactly what I was going to say that that her sure, you say it this time and I'll pretend I didn't. <laughs> her response to fear, which is the the only way she can take care of herself is her imagination and and seeing beauty when instead she could just think it would be awfully cold and hard and I might fall out sleeping in a wild, wild cherry tree instead of wouldn't it be nice to sleep in a wild cherry tree? Yeah. It's, it's... And speaking as someone who throughout my childhood could, and my adulthood for that matter, could always rely on having a warm, soft, non-tree branch place to sleep at night, I don't think I would actually have this reaction to the prospect of having nowhere to sleep, but in a tree. I probably just wouldn't sleep in a tree, actually, because I'm quite afraid of heights. I would sleep under the tree. Mm -hmm. But I, I have a hard time believing I would have been ex as excited about it at age 11 as Anne says she is. And who is she telling that she was looking forward to sleeping in a wild cherry tree. Is she telling Matthew? Is she telling herself? Does, I mean, I wonder what she thinks about Matthew's involvement with what, she, what she's saying. Does she think he's not really listening to her? And so she's just kind of talking to fill the silence. Well, this is an interesting question too, around 
comfort with silence that you just brought up to me because uh, I was looking for a different quotation to bring up. Matthew, however, was spared the ordeal of speaking first. It's interesting, you know, I think Anne seems very afraid of not being valued and not having her views or experiences or ideas valued as part of a wider just not being valued at all. And Matthew is afraid of speaking first. So this is the symbiosis where their fears could make them seem like opposites, but it's also why they can work together. He's afraid of speaking first. She's afraid of not being heard. Perfect. Um, I suppose you are Mr. Cuthbert of Green Gables. I'm very glad to see you. I was beginning to be afraid you weren't coming for me and imagining all the things that might have happened to prevent you. That is some serious anxiety. You know, if you tell a psychologist that every time somebody's late, you imagine all the things that might have happened to them, they might be concerned you have anxiety. I wonder if she was imagining I'll, I'll say realistic things in quotes, like a horse throwing a shoe or a wheel breaking on the wagon or, or less realistic, more gruesome things like, you know, being impaled on a pitchfork or something like that. I wonder if the very, if the completely realistic because it's real possibility that he didn't want her, that not that he didn't want her, that she wasn't the orphan they ordered occurred to her. I mean, she wants to tell the story as if all these things that might have happened to prevent you, as if it would be something external. But I do wonder if there's a very real and founded fear of just, they don't want to come get me. Um, I mean, I think it's, this is a theme that's going to come up in the coming chapters, but it's so important to me that I feel so important to understand that Anne is not melodramatic. She is developing coping mechanisms for an, in fact, very dramatic situation. And if you think she's melodramatic, it can only be from a position of incredible privilege compared to what she is implied and explicitly said to have gone through leading up to this moment. Her fears of abandonment are not irrational. Her fears of being unloved are not baseless anxieties. They're demonstrative. And, and she's only 11. I've had it explained to me in a parenting context by another parent of a small child that every emotion your child experiences up to a point, and I think 11 might still be included in that age range, is the most intense version of that feeling your child has ever felt. Like, when my four-month-old is tired, so two nights ago, we all stayed up too late, and he just was inconsolable, and we couldn't settle him even though he was so tired. He's never felt that miserable before in his life, because he's only four months old. When a two-year-old can't have their favorite cup at lunch because it's in the dishwasher. Like, their disappointment over that is A, real disappointment, B, possibly the most intense disappointment they have ever felt. And so seeing Anne as melodramatic is not only downplaying the trauma of being orphaned as an infant and in unhappy living situations since then, but it's also saying, like, I as an adult who've had, who has had however many years of practicing these emotions and experiencing these emotions, and I know what this feels like, you're not allowed to have that intensity of experience the first time you feel it. And I think throughout this series, children are used as a lens to analyze the ridiculousness and hypocrisies of adult behavior. And that's something I 
believe in quite strongly as somebody who works with children and who works with adults. And one of the things I find fascinating, you know, in adult critiques of children is that they're not generally inaccurate, but they're unfair because of the implicit statement that adults are different. You know, we think of a two-year-old upset that they can't get their favorite sippy cup. Have you, I've been a waiter at a restaurant serving adults and adults throwing tantrums because they don't get their favorite. That's the daily life of all restaurant servers is tantrums that compete with anything I've witnessed as the parent of toddler twins. The idea that adults don't have tantrums. What? The idea that adults don't get melodramatic, the idea that adults don't respond emotionally disproportionately to the external stimulus. Like, where, where do you get that notion? Have you met adults? Or even the idea that, that adults shouldn't be allowed to. Like, I had a favorite coffee cup that has been my coffee cup since I started drinking coffee at an embarrassingly young age that my mom and I got together at a farmer's market when I was going to, I guess, a music institute over the summer when I was 12, 13, like I said, embarrassingly young. And I broke that cup last spring and I called my mother in tears to tell her that I broke my favorite coffee cup that we bought at the farmer's market together all yeah. those years ago. I was so upset. I was so sad about losing my favorite cup and I'm ostensibly an adult. And I, I don't think having that feeling is the bad thing, actually. I think telling adults that those are emotions for two-year-olds is the problem. Amen. You know, and I'm thinking as we, you know, Anne, like, is stereotypically normative and, and for some reason, as a preteen, is deeply concerned with her appearance and people's perception of her appearance. But why do I, as an adult, not throw uh, epic tantrums about being forced to do my hair or dress in a way that I find embarrassing? Well, it's mostly because I'm allowed to pick how I do my hair and how I get dressed not because I've actually outgrown a fear of embarrassment entirely. Uh, I haven't. I'm just not in a position where a Marilla or a parent is giving me something ugly I have to wear. So what is, is it maturity or is it just the privilege of control over yourself and the balance of those things? I wanna shift focus a little bit Although this conversation of adult and child emotions lining up is kind of a nice segue, actually. I don't know if this relates to fear. Maybe you can make it relate to fear. <laughs> but when Anne and Matthew come into the avenue where there are cherry trees planted and it's... Uh, right? They're cherry trees or are they apple trees? I think they're apple trees, actually. Yes, they're apple trees. Yeah. That's, I should have known that. Anna is talking about how beautiful it is, and Matthew says it's pretty, and she says, oh no, pretty doesn't even begin to describe it. And she starts talking about this thrill that she feels when she sees the apple trees, and she asks Matthew if he ever gets a thrill, a deep ache in her breast. And Matthew says, well, yeah, I think I do when I pull grubs out of the potatoes. This is such a beautiful illustration of their communication style together, I think. And I wanted to know how you feel about this part. I love it. I, I just think it's, it's humorous and on a deep level, there's unspoken understanding between them. And there's also deep, deep lack of understanding and I love that combination of things. I think when I first, well, when I reread this in preparation today, Matthew's response did strike me as humorous. I think I just saw it as really emphasizing uh, the contrast between Anne's imaginative, whimsical vision of the world and Matthew and by extension Marilla's extreme pragmatism. Just Matthew's closest thing to a thrill is just kind of pragmatically getting 
the work done. So this is an interesting perspective for me to start to process right now. The word thrill, Matthew relates to grubs, and Anne has related to something nice. And it... Yeah, I, I think it is supposed to be funny in terms of authorial intent, but I've also been doing a lot of thinking throughout my adult life, and especially in the past six months, about a relationship to food and a relationship to land and how that relates to agriculture as part of nature or an invasion of nature. And so Matthew's thrill over pulling grubs out of potatoes, and they're not supposed to be in the potatoes, they're not going to help the potatoes grow well. It, it could just be disgust. I think that's what the author likely had in mind. But it also could be respect or awe or wonder at that part of creation, even as he's removing it. We see in chapter one that Matthew seldom makes his mind up about anything, which makes it all the more extraordinarily poignant and powerful when he does. And this violates creative writing 101 professor's insistence on show, don't tell. But it is shown in chapter two with how much he says, I, I, I'm not sure, I don't know, I don't understand, uh, constantly claiming not to understand things. And yet, I think he's quite wise and very much understands so very much. And that this is a, a performative, not, in, not insincere, but still a performative humility an acknowledgement of not knowing or fully understanding, but he's, his I don't understand isn't I know nothing. It's, he's actually holding himself to a high bar of understanding, I think. And he's being humble because I can imagine that Matthew and Mrs. Lind, for example, might know the exact same amount about something. And Mrs. Lind would say, I know exactly what needs to be done. It's this, this, and this. And Matthew with the same quantity of knowledge would say, I just don't understand because it's not about how much they know, it's their own attitude towards what they know. And I think Matthew is understanding so much more about Anne and her feelings and her circumstances than he'll say with words, but his being on her side, holding her hand, taking her home anyway, and later sticking up for her a few times shows to me that he profoundly understands oh so very much. Uh, and I think underestimating our own understanding of things is certainly a common human trait. I have had recent experiences helping my grade seven children with homework. I was particularly struck by a moment where one of them was very upset that she didn't understand her math homework, showed me a page of pro problems she had already done, telling me she doesn't understand. And she had all of the problems correct. And that to me, she was reminding me of Matthew in this moment where he got everything right, but still said, but I just don't understand. And it made me think, well, what is your bar for claiming to understand? And I think in her case, she just wanted to have a better sense of the mathematical theory as to why this was working. Getting the correct answers weren't enough. But the Mrs. Rachel Lind in that grade seven math class would be like, I got a hundred, I understood. I also wonder, not to get too pop psychologist on this, but I wonder if there may be an element of Matthew being a nonverbal processor, that mm. when he's asked a question in words about an experience that didn't involve words, like a thrill. Oh, I'm so sorry. I found the thing about grubs. All right. He's pulling grubs out of cucumber beds, not potato beds, which actually makes more Important sense. Important correction. Yes. Well, because... Potatoes grow underground, and grubs don't live underground, so it actually is important. Yes. <laughs> anyway, when Anne asks him this question about, do things ever give you a thrill? Matthew needs time, so much time to think that it's in the text that he's taking time to think. And so when he's asked other questions about his own experience, I 
wouldn't be surprised based on my experience of my spouse who is a nonverbal processor he just doesn't have the words to explain what his experience is and therefore he says I don't know because he doesn't know how to express it which is not the same as genuinely not knowing no it's not being able to share yeah and i think you know in the case of matthew we recognize what he understands by what he does his actions will speak towards his emotional understanding consistently throughout this book he understands more than he says but how does he act in response to what he hears will always be very significant whereas I actually think the same principle holds for Anne, but it's almost harder to see because she says so very much. But we have to keep looking at what she does to understand what she's actually valuing and what she's actually prioritizing through all the words that she uses. Uh, And in this chapter, when you want to talk about fear, I think how extraordinarily positive and fanciful and romantic her perception of the road to Green Gables becomes increasingly tragic. The more she loves it, the more beautiful and magical she finds it, the higher the stakes are becoming for how Marilla is going to respond to her. If she didn't love every single thing so profoundly about Avonlea, her not getting to stay is a lot less sad. So it is this interesting way that we see her fears entirely through chipper words expressed in a chipper way. But again, I guess this goes to my, you know, utopian dystopian mirror theory that we see what she's so afraid of not having by how excited she is at what she'll potentially have. And I love what you said about Matthew's actions showing us what he understands instead of his words saying he doesn't know, because he can see through all of this chatter. Anne has been telling him about her bookshelf friend and her mirror friend. And she asks, why is that pond called Barry's Pond? And he says, well, Mr. Barry lives over there and he has a daughter your age and I think you might be friends. He tells Anne about Diana right away Mm -hmm. because he's noticed how lonely she is. And we know how afraid Matthew is of little girls, particularly well-bred little girls like Diana. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't bring her up if there weren't a reason to do it. He probably wouldn't be able to articulate that that's why he brought up Diana. But I have to imagine that it's because of some kind of processing that was going on that Matthew wouldn't be able to explain, but that he was doing anyway. So I had written in my notes, the antidote to fear is question mark. I think we see Matthew and Anne giving us, well, on the one hand, silence, on the other hand, chatter. Those are more coping mechanisms than actual solutions. Anne brings in a conversation of beauty. There's the beginnings of what will become a very beautiful love between Anne and Matthew. But I'm actually following on this conversation wondering if perhaps the antidote to fear is attention that Anne and Matthew are paying particularly that Matthew is paying attention to what is really there instead of what he's afraid is there I think the antidote to fear to me would depend on what you're afraid of so if Matthew is mostly afraid of mystery, not knowing what to say, not knowing what to do, um, certainty is his antidote to fear. If 
Anne's fear is abandonment. Security is her antidote to fear. And uh, when you pose the question, what is the antidote to fear? I admit I'm biased by my day job. And uh, immediately what came to my mind was a passage from the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts away all fear. Perfect love casts away fear is a biblical principle that I, you know, Lucy Maud Montgomery would certainly have been aware of this concept and probably specifically of this verse, that the antidote to fear is love. But where she's getting deep and not just keeping it at a cliche level, it's a cliche, I think, because it's true, but where she's getting deeper is not just saying love is the solution, but actually acknowledging that they each need to experience love in a particular way that matches their particular fears. So it's a bit, it's correct, but a lazy surface level to say, well, what Matthew and Anne both need is love, but they both need a love that is targeted for their fears. And I was actually coming at this somewhat biased by the New Testament as well. Um, but by the letter to the Philippians, chapter four, verse six, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Anne is doing a really good job of thanksgiving, less so of making her requests be known, actually, in this chapter. Although she doesn't ask to be allowed to stay yet because she doesn't know that that's not what's going to happen. And once once she's told that she can't stay, she does make it known that she wants to stay. So I, that's, that's sort of my foundation for coming into a conversation about fear and, and a solution to fear. And I actually find it interesting that the translation I was thinking of of this verse uses the word anxious hmm. rather than worry. And that both anxiety and worry are separate from fear. That I think fear is, is something that A, can actually hurt you and B, is actually there. Whereas anxiety a potential. is of, of something that may be there and you don't know. So I wonder actually if it's not quite fair to equate Matthew's anxiety with Anne's fear. Anne is afraid of things continuing the way they have already been in her life. Matthew is anxious about things he's imagining are happening in other people's heads. Yes, but that still is the foundation of how he really does live. You know, he dreaded things. So the author does use strong language. I think your distinction is accurate, but whether or not our self perceptions are accurate, they are what we perceive. Um, as somebody who does a fair amount of counseling in my work life, for example, I've had situations where I independently counsel two people who are causing each other's emotional distress. And people have asked, well, how do you even do that uh, without taking a side? And part of it is because when I'm meeting with one person, their version of the events is the true version of the events. Even if it's not true, because it's the version of the events that they are making decisions based on. So it's not my role as somebody who counsels them to tell them that their perceptions and their feelings are wrong. I can ask leading questions to get them to, you know, to pose other possibilities, but they're living in the reality they're living in, even if a regular observer or even an extraordinary observer might say that the reality is different. Um, so I think you are right that Matthew and Anne's anxieties and fears are not equivalent, but they are each driving them in a very real way. I also wanted to note when you were talking about Thanksgiving, the thing that occurred to me is how when we are deliberately thankful, that still is a reflection on what we value 
sometimes it's a reflection on what we fear not having that we bother to specifically be grateful for having it. Um, this is a thing that I see routinely in my household. We say grace before meals and what different members of the household will be explicitly thankful for in a day in which maybe we actually objectively shared most of the same blessings, but what each of us brings to say explicitly, I am grateful for this thing is still deeply reflective of values. And so when Anne is being positive and thankful, it's still telling. He's thankful for beauty in a way that Matthew doesn't seem to be when they're objectively on the same road seeing the same thing. So what does that say about each of them and their values? I ask rhetorically and or for real, depending on if you have an answer. Well, my easy answer is that Matthew's lived there his whole life. He doesn't know any different. And there's even if you can recognize the beauty in the place that you've lived your whole life, it's not the same as someone seeing it with new eyes or as leaving and coming back. I've reflected on this during and after my moves in my adult life that I, for example, when I lived in Chicago, I missed Montreal the whole time I was there. And then once I moved back to Montreal, I missed Chicago in a way that I hadn't expected to while I was living there, that I couldn't appreciate fully what I was experiencing until I wasn't anymore. And so Matthew has never had that leaving and coming back or being able to see it for the first time the way Anne is. We, I mean, we get a blow by blow of Anne's first experience in reputedly the most beautiful place in the world. As I said last time, I haven't been there. Which is a travesty that with enough support from Patreon supporters, you will be able to imagine. <laughs> I think we need the pandemic to end first. We also need the pandemic to end. <laughs> With an end to the pandemic and enough gifts on Patreon to support Erica's travel to Cavendish PEI. And obviously I have to go to guide you with no selfish motivation. I think that's also getting at why a child as a protagonist and a point of view character is so enlightening is it allows all the readers to see everything for the first time. You know, it's how different would Avonlea be if Rachel Lind is our point of view character? Or if oh, Matthew's can we do a whole episode on that at some point? Probably, sure. I have too many thoughts. I mean, I I know that last week was already all about Rachel Lind because, I mean, it, the chapter is all about Rachel Lind, and then I further made it all about Rachel Lind, but. It's always been this way, and it will remain this way, because that is the correct way. And if anything stops being this way, it shall be duly amended through a committee action promptly. Spoken like a true Presbyterian. I selflessly volunteer myself as chair of this action committee. I, I think it would be an interesting perspective, of course, you know, what... Well, I, I don't think it would sustainably be an interesting perspective, which is why we need a point of view character who is a child who is new to town. But it still as a contrast would be fascinating to me to be, you know, what is Avonlea life? Avonlea life like for Matthew, for Marilla, for Rachel. And yeah, you don't appreciate the beauty and wonder of a place if you've always been there. You know, certainly I think there's a very common young adult trend to believe that wherever you grew up is a complete dump of a place that one must escape. And then you go back later, and I grew up in a very objectively beautiful and touristy place that I thought was a bit of a dump of a place that I had to escape. And I didn't understand why my hometown where I went to high school was full of out-of-state license plates every summer. I just thought, why are you coming here? Where, where are you from that this is so beautiful? They were from New York, obviously. That's why Massachusetts was beautiful. That doesn't make any sense. 
uh, for our listeners, this is a completely unnecessary New York versus Massachusetts society. Um, but, you know, and I, I wonder about people who grow up in Cavendish PEI thinking, Horace, what are you doing here? What? It, it's just boring. It's just, why are you here? Because uh, I imagine that a kid in Cavendish feels the way I felt about Cape Cod. Like, what are you, what are you doing here? Go, go away. Um, I will say that geographically, and in terms of landscape and natural beauty and climate and weather, if Western Central New York were part of Canada, I would still live there. I understand. I understand. <laughs> um, I part of so having grown up in, in part on Cape Cod, I believe Prince Edward Island is maintaining what Cape Cod probably used to be like. So. Uh, if you want the best of Cape Cod, I recommend that you move to Prince Edward Island. You heard it. Here. Except don't, because then it'll ruin it for everyone else. That's the problem. Like, I need to move to PEI and then nobody else. Yes. It's like how hipster tourists love to go to places that tourists don't go and that tourists haven't ruined. And you're like, you you know what you are when you have a backpack on and you're on vacation? You, you know what? Um, so Anne is this fascinating perspective, though, into how beautiful all of these places are or could be. And, you know, if you go today to the Lake of Shining Waters, it's fine. And it's either the most spectacularly beautiful place in the world or it's just a little pond. You know, we still have the option of how we choose to perceive things. Um, well, I think that would be a great topic for the future as well, is how do characters choose to perceive the same places or the same events? All right, so Matthew is surprised. You made this discussion kind of center around fear. Do you think at the end of the chapter, Matthew is more or less afraid than at the beginning of the chapter? This is the third to last paragraph in the chapter. When he, Matthew, thought of that rapt light being quenched in her eyes, he had an uncomfortable feeling that he was going to assist at murdering something. I think he's more afraid. Mm -hmm. But of something different now. That he, was, he started out being afraid of Anne, and he is now afraid of letting her down. Yeah, he's or hurting her when she's already been so hurt. Well, I think that's also really interesting because we perceive Matthew as a you know a quiet loner, and it's very easy to imagine that quiet loners are afraid of getting hurt, and he's very much portrayed as being afraid of getting hurt in the very beginning of this chapter. He's afraid of people because he's afraid they're making fun of him. He's afraid they will hurt him. But I think the other side of that kind of introvert loner fear of human interaction is very much being afraid of hurting people being afraid that you're going to screw it up and get it wrong and that you know that's fairly explicit here in this chapter that we're set up to think of him as a bit of a loner because he's afraid of getting hurt and that isn't untrue it's just not the whole story now he's afraid of hurting her and I think one of the things that we also see in real life and fictional parenting and parenting relationships is how the most well-intentioned adults try to not hurt children the way that they've been hurt. So this makes me wonder when and how that part of him may have been murdered, which is why oh. that's the kind of exact thing he does not want to do. Because I know in my own experience as a parent, there are a lot of ways in which I don't want to hurt my children, all of them. But I'm most afraid of hurting them in the ways that I've been hurt. Those are the ones I'm most proactive about not repeating. You know, the, per the, the pendulum swings that I think many of us do intergenerationally. Um, whatever I feel my parents got wrong based on my experience is what I'm most adamant not to get wrong. 
and then of course I will then get new things wrong that I will see in how my grandchildren are raised. We've been joking since before we had kids that we just want our kids, we know our kids are going to need therapy, we just want them to need it for different things than we do. At the very least, I want my children to feel absolutely no shame in getting therapy. That is a really good place to start from. I'm going to just start with, there will be no stigma from your dad if your relationship with your dad leads you to see a therapist. Uh, so Matthew has fears, and I think we're going to see more in the next chapter about what Marilla fears and how those fears play out and how they raise. Anne will be fascinating to see as well, because I think loving, lovingly intended parents and parental figures like Matthew and Marilla, when they're being strict, it's often to spare a child a very distinct kind of pain that they often personally know. You know it isn't just for strictness sake. I think it's just so poignant to see how Matthew is afraid of murdering something within her. Oh. I didn't think it was possible for me to love Matthew anymore, but I think I do now. As we look at the very end of this chapter, listen to the trees talking in their sleep, she whispered as he lifted her to the ground. I just think that's such a cute moment to just physically picture. What nice dreams they must have. I wonder what Anne's dreams that night are like. Well, she has a long way to go before sleep, so uh, maybe not good. Yes. So I, I love mean, that what, what are the dreams too, that she hopes it... in this moment, and then what are the dreams actually? It's going to be a bit of a chasm. I love that line too because I read this. I had this read to me for the first time when I was a very small child, and eleven seemed like a big kid to me. Mm -hmm. But now, as an adult, as a parent, as a teacher, that statement makes me realize how little she is, what a little girl she still is in this moment. Well, and I think these moments of the physical, the physicality between Matthew and Anne ground us back in her littleness in a way that her language and speaking throw us off of. So around the pages upon pages of her speaking quite eloquently, imaginatively, with advanced vocabulary throughout, it begins with her having a scrawny hand being held, and it ends with him picking her up. So we know that she's, you know, he's a strong man, he's a farmer, but it still is this physicality of remember she's little, that he's, she's not climbing down, he's grabbing her and putting her down. Uh, and I think really in any literature that's talking about a tween coming of age, we live in that both and of they're a grown up, they're a tiny baby. That's the whole nature of being a tween. But I, I find it interesting how Lucy Maud Montgomery bookends our introduction to Anne in that with the physicality of the little girl and the mouth of a young woman. And, and that's part of being 11 is that it's not either or, these can both be true. We can be fragile little children and extremely verbose adults, kind of at all ages, but it's very normal for 11. My sister actually ran a draft past me of writing advice for undergrad students. And one of the things she included said, write the way you speak, don't use big words in your writing unless you also use them in conversation. And I looked at her and I said, I think you need to revise this based on the way you speak, based on the way I speak, to say, if you use long words in daily conversation, keep using them in your writing. Yes. Well, <laughs> this is a... Well, to get political for a moment, this may be edited later. Uh, every once in a while, young people, often young women, get very vocal in politics, whether it's some of the Parkland survivors, Greta Thunberg, uh, 
even adult young women who, you know, 20 and 30 somethings in Congress and Parliament. And I see in political discourse, a way that people strive to dismiss them is by claiming that young people can't really speak like this. Somebody must be putting them up to it. They don't talk like this, you know, their vocabulary, that's not natural for teenagers. Uh, I get horrified when I hear politicians disagreeing with these eloquent young teenagers by saying, I have a 17 year old and they can't talk like this. I'm like, please don't publicly throw your 17 year old under the bus like this because as a former nerdy teenager who is now a nerdy adult, I talked like that. I used big words. I got accused of plagiarism in high school just because I used my own vocabulary in an essay. And I think that that's something we see here with Anne. I think people do underestimate the eloquence and intelligence of youth. I really appreciate how certain young adult authors shamelessly fight against that. Whether it's Lucy Maud Montgomery or John Green, I have no patience for critiques that say teenagers don't really talk like that because I just think hang out with different teenagers. And the fact that young adult literature, which is by definition going to be read by the most bookwormy and precocious of the young adults, reflects bookwormy and precocious young adults makes sense. It's not unrealistic to a reader of Lucy Maud Montgomery or John Green, who's 12, to picture 12 year olds using big words and being really into reading. That's obviously the target audience can be like, that makes sense. It's a bit meta, but it makes I sense. I really can't say whether I was like that as a 12 year old because of Anne or if reading Anne of Green Gables, having Anne of Green Gables read to me in elementary school encouraged me to become like that. Mm -hmm. I, it's impossible to know. We'll never know at this stage. It's an impossible and chicken. My and child is not an appropriate experiment either because he's hearing this book starting now. I've actually been doing my pre-reading out loud to him. So Excellent. we'll never know if it's cause and effect or just relating because that's the way we are. What would it be like as a control group to have a child who is not raised on Anne of Green Gables is uh, an experiment that Eric and I both deem unethical and refuse to run in our own households. We have no control group. We refuse to raise children that way. We're not risking it. Not going to happen. We'll never know. Uh, nope. It's not worth it to either of us, but... This is an essential text. Yeah. This may be irrelevant for our podcast, but... And I'll delete it if I decide it is, but with Annie's advice to undergrads, one of the things that I found very distinct at my university is I believed we had an undergraduate accent, that there was actually a distinct way that undergrads at my university spoke that was geographically independent. And I would describe it at my university as gender neutral valley girl stereotype, but men spoke this way too with big words. So if you walked around campus, you would hear a whole lot of, oh my God, I just like think you really need to think about how that paradigm shift totally changes the foundational premise. But that was genuinely how people were speaking on my campus all the time. It was, so if anybody was like, foundational premise and paradigm shift aren't natural language. I'm like, have you walked around this campus? Yeah, they are. I don't know what to tell you. Um, just in the, I wouldn't even know what people are talking about. I'd just be walking behind groups on campus. I'm like, I really just think your framework is flawed and based on a false correlation. And I thought that was a beautiful. I think it would be weirder too, in my vocal in our friend circle fun. where everyone has like a background in literature and gender studies and theology and children childhood development to some degree it would be weirder if our friends didn't speak like that yes so oh it's going to be fun to analyze some of the conversations between diana and Anne because they're both i believe portrayed as very intelligent and i have no objection to that most small towns do have two very intelligent girls in the class you know maybe not everybody spoke like that but they both have their intelligence filtered through very different expectations and life experiences. So seeing how their kindred spirits and I think comparably intelligent young ladies 
with different social expectations is going to be a, a fascinating thing to watch. I think they're kindred spirits because they've decided they are, but that is a conversation for another day. Thanks for listening to Kindred Spirits. Follow us on Facebook at Kindred Spirits Podcast, on Twitter at Kindred Spirits P, and on Instagram at Kindred Spirits P. On our website, kindredspiritspodcast.ca, you can find show notes, links to us on all social media and podcast platforms, and information on how to follow or contact us individually. Thank you to our founding Patreon supporters, Sarah K, Marilyn B, Anne M, Connor H.B., Marie-André, and Jennifer O. If you would also like to support our ambitions and help us build our castles in the sky, you too can support us on patreon.com slash kindred spirits podcast, as well as subscribing on your podcaster of choice and leaving a review. Our theme music is Desperates and Across the Causeway from Algoma Highway, composed by Ari Vandeven and performed by the Cygnus Trio, which includes me. You can buy our music and learn more at thesignistrio.com. Anne of Green Gables was written by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Episodes are written by us, Erica Jacobs Perkins and Jean Daniello Denha. Kindred spirits are not so scarce as I used to think. It's splendid to find out there are so many of them in the world. It is. So have we solved chapter two? I think we've solved chapter two. Aside from a piece of advice I have, which is for the station master who is locking up the ticket office preparatory to going home for supper when Matthew arrives. And my advice for this unnamed brisk official is please don't go home while there's still a child at the train station. Stay there. Make sure she's collected by a responsible adult. She may think she's going to spend the night in a cherry tree, but you should not think that.